This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Today we're going to cover the book Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez, a book about who lives, who dies, and why. As for who recommended the book, that would be your domain, Eric. All right, and that would be Laird Hamilton at Laird Life on Twitter. He also recommended the book Natural Born Heroes, which was number four of our reading list this year and, and one that we uh, we had a good time covering in, uh, in that podcast episode. He's a surfer and a limit pusher. As mentioned in episode four you had the presence of mind to marry gabby reese someone <laughs> for whom as jason pointed out neon dion sanders could not even get a date with her so the one thing as a, as one person told me who was there at the time the one thing that dion ever wanted in his life that he couldn't have lawrence gonzalez is the author of this book he's the author of numerous books and has won many awards including two national magazine awards and the distinguished service award from the society of professional journalists his father was a survivor of World War II and is, is kind of the genesis of this book in a lot of ways where he was uh, the survivor of a, of a crash and that always piqued Lawrence's uh, – uh, yeah, so I've lost my train of thought because Jason's doing funny things on the, on the video cam. So <laughs> it'll be behind Finally the scenes, gotcha. uh, it'll be behind, behind the scenes uh, funny time. Um, so yeah, his his father survived a crash that many others didn't survive, and it it just led a desire in uh, in Lawrence to to understand why people survive, how they don't, and what the the result is. This book, Deep Survival. So let's go into to the uh, the overview section and our initial reactions. Jason, do you want to start? Yeah, why not? Uh, one of the things that I mean, I I really enjoyed this book. First of all, it's a really easy read. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of the this is one of the easiest reads of all the books we've had so far. Uh, you know, it just flies by. Uh, his his writing style is very, um, uh, very very lucid and very relaxed. Uh, so it's it's a book that you can that you can really pleasure read and still get a lot out of. Uh, so I like that a lot. Also. Uh, a couple things really stuck out to me in this book that that I think are really useful. Uh, number one is the importance of humility in everything in life, and actually a good definition for humility, which I think is something that most of of Western culture struggles with. Uh, I actually think that our our tendency is to favor false humility, uh, this sense of you know oh you should think little of yourself rather than what the book really gets into. Uh, which we'll we'll discuss a little bit later, but you know to to front that a little bit, that basically humility boils down to being constantly willing to learn and willing to be taught, uh, to maintain a beginner's state of mind, and how important that is to being a survivor, to being someone. And I think if we expand that beyond just surviving, it's to be to thriving and to being successful in other avenues of life. Uh, and that's come up a few other times, but I think he nails it by 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 calling it what it is. It's humility. That is that is what what defines humility. Uh, and then the other thing is, I I loved parts of the book that just emphasized over and over again the importance of humor under pressure, and and staying loose, uh, sometimes with what might seem to be really you know dark humor or sick sense of humor. Which, if you know anything about the family uh, I, I I come from, uh, we're 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 we have a little bit of a black sense of humor. Uh, uh, on both, you know, stretching back on both sides of the family, so I'm quite at home with that, and perhaps that's why uh, uh, I identified so much with certain parts of that. Yeah, and it's something I, did, I listen to a few podcasts of, of Navy, Navy SEALs, and they always talk about that how important that is to uh, to have that sense of of humor. Uh, so one thing that when you were talking about humility that I thought of is something that you actually, I heard from you for the first time actually. And that is CS Lewis's definition of, of humility. Uh, do you want to hit that real quick? Because I thought that kind of coincides well with, with, with what you're just saying about 
uh, people people feeling that that humility is depreciating them themselves. Uh, but instead, what did C.S. Lewis say it is? Yeah, Lewis is uh, Lewis says actually quite a bit about uh, pride and uh, humility. Um, but uh, perhaps his his most well known quote on this is uh, that pride is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Uh, and that that lines up some with this. Uh, although, again, if you're getting to then what humility is as sort of a, a counter to pride, it's uh, it's 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 less a again, it is a less a focus on oneself and more a focus on the task and on learning the task. So instead of worrying about one's image or worrying about whether, you know, I come across as an expert, making sure that I'm actually getting stuff right. <laughs> Yeah, and being committed to that rather than to my own image, uh, I think that's the that's the key there to humility over pride in in that case. And and yeah, Lewis Lewis talks a ton about this in terms of um of uh, what pride is and uh, and all of that. And we can put some links to that in in the uh, in the show notes uh, for those who are interested. Okay, well, yeah, uh, back to this book. My my uh, main takeaway is that deep survival is uh, not what we normally consider to be survival of the fittest in the sense of the, the strongest survive or, or I, I guess uh, the, the definition of, of being most, ad, most adaptable is what is the survivors of the fit, survival of the fittest that, that would tie in well with this book uh, uh, people that are able to adapt to the situations um, but not, not necessarily the, the strongest or, the smartest or the even the most well prepared uh we see that throughout this book that um that people you would expect to make it in given cir- circumstances don't are are the ones that that don't uh what and we'll hit in hit that uh, a little bit later on but uh i i i enjoyed the book i thought it was awesome uh it, it tied a lot of concepts together from other tools of titans books uh one just even from the old man in the sea where uh he he's talking about Callahan loved his Dorados even as he ate them and he started talking to the fish and in that uh, we see that a lot in old man in the sea the the old man's respect for for fish and uh, and respect even even as as he has to kill him the right stuff by Tom Wolf was highlighted throughout this book uh, quite a few places and that is one of the the later books in in our books of Titans list so that that was cool to see that and and I read that recently and and so it was, yeah, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of connection points there. And then, uh, there's a, a nice contrast with, uh, natural born heroes that we can, we can discuss a little later on. Yeah, definitely. But, but yeah, o- overall great, uh, great and very, very helpful, uh, useful book. So, uh, let's get into favorite quotes, our quotes and I favorite oh, quotes. I think we may be tied. We're tied. This I think is Six the first apiece. time we've had. First of all, it's the first time we've had this few, which is not a sign of how little we liked the book. We both liked the book a lot, but we, we were able to distill more of what we liked into fewer quotes, and yeah. we had the same amount, the same number, yep. which is I think that's also a first out of uh, twenty-seven episodes. How about that? Yeah. Well, and I, I usually um, I put a star when I'm reading. I, I put a star next to to uh, quotes I really like, and so even though I've only highlighted six, I've got a ton of stars in my yeah, book. I probably here, got so. 30 or 40. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with my first one. It, it, this, this kind of is a, a overall type of uh, a good summary of, of a lot of what happens in the book. So it is with the paradox of survival. There is no one point at which a man or woman can be said to have survived and be a perfect survivor until he or she is dead. For each test is a preparation for the next. By its very nature, a survival situation like life itself comes upon you unexpectedly. So only if a life is lived in its entirety as an act of survival can you have a hope of finding correct action at the moment of crisis. Survival is a path that must be walked from birth to death. It is a way of life. That's a dang good quote. I, and and, it, and it, it, it hits on a lot of what he talks about in the, in the, in the book. And, and there's, there's some parts where he said... He, you can't you can't judge a life until you see how that person has died. So that, that was a that's a that lesson was from a, Solon. Uh, I remember tra- translating that passage from uh, Herodotus years ago while I was doing my masters. 
Nice, nice. Actually, no, that and, would have been my senior year of undergrad, I believe. So that would have been 2004, I think, or 2000. That would have been that would have been the fall of 2004 because I took that uh, took or to fall of 2003. When okay. I, when I translated that passage, I, that, that took me back a little bit. Nice. And then uh, the other part of that quote is uh, what we've seen in a, in, a, in a lot of the books this year is the the whole daily daily habits piece of the puzzle and how things don't you, you don't just all of a sudden you're not going to respond correctly in a big bang type of a situation unless the daily daily pieces are there. And that that is shown throughout this book. It's it's you're not all of a sudden a hero. You're it's it's a lifetime of of making small choices, uh, what may be seen as insignificant choices and how those lead up to uh, preparation for when that that uh, moment of crisis comes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to go ahead then with my uh, first one here, uh, and that is. I want to die in my sleep like my grandfather, not yelling and screaming like the passengers in his car. <laughs> it's just too good, man. That 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 being up in a fighter pilot's that sign being up in a fighter pilot's uh, area just that that to me is that 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 typifies the kind of black humor that both sides of my family have, but my mother would like to deny that, uh, that she enjoys. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my next one. Only 10 to 20% of untrained people can stay calm and think in the midst of a survival emergency. And I put this one in here because I've, I've talked about this in another episode, but my, uh, my experience in Costa Rica of getting robbed at gunpoint I definitely did not stay calm and I did not think in the midst of that emergency. So um, I am definitely one of the 80 to 90 percent of people who who uh, cannot stay stay calm or, or think in the midst of a survival emergency. So uh, you're also one of the most easily startled people I know. Yeah. Uh, I, and I think a lot of that is from getting getting robbed. But um I'm also very ticklish, so that doesn't help. Yeah, yeah. I can tickle myself. Yeah, that is a unique. I I, I can't even imagine. Like I can't even imagine that. First of all, I'm not ticklish. Like I'm not ticklish by others, and I'm also virtually impossible to startle. It used to be a game with roommates and people you know that I knew in college and so on, constantly jumping out trying to start trying to startle me, just trying to get me to make any sort of visible movement. And uh, generally speaking, uh, people left very disappointed. I think the vast majority. I think there may have been one or two times where anybody ever noticed any any movement or blinking or anything. Yeah, it just it processes quickly and I don't move. So <laughs> funny thing about that is I actually uh, when I when I got my cat, Oscar, uh, he was easily startled and we would startle him quite frequently just to watch him jump. And, you know, he'd jump about, you know, two, three feet up in the air and, you know, spin around in the in the air or whatever. But it actually got it, the funny part about it is after about, I don't know, a year or so of just constantly startling that animal, he has completely been shell-shocked to the point of, like, he's he's utterly impossible to startle now. It's funny. Like, you you don't see him start at anything. Like, you'll drop, you know, you can drop something really heavy right behind him or whatever, massive sound, nothing. You know, so big, daily habits... Daily habits and training also work for cats. We trained the we trained the cat to be to a be survivor. to be chill. <laughs> He's a total survivor on this, and he doesn't have any like he doesn't have any of the normal responses that you'd expect on this. He's just totally chill. Like, oh, what? Oh, so you're carrying that? Whatever. My wife actually is concerned that this is actually going to be the cat's downfall because <laughs> he just doesn't like he's totally honey badgerish now. He just doesn't care. And he, that she's like, one of these days, like somebody's going to drop something on him or, you know, he's going to walk <laughs> under you while you're doing power cleans or something, because we'll be, I'll be out there with, 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 you know, somebody who works out with me, we'll be doing 
you know, we'll be doing cleans and dropping the weight. So you're, you know, dropping 275 pounds or something on the ground. And, you know, that makes a big racket. And the cat's standing like or sitting, laying down like six feet away, just kind of looking yeah. at us like, yep. He'll walk well, right by more, nothing. He just doesn't care. More, yeah, he's more apt to, to sur- survive a, a emergency situation than I am. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there is that. But um, uh, what's your next one? <laughs> yeah, my, my my wife was just uh, was just uh, in the, hearing this in the background, and she just handed me a note saying, "Unfortunately, training the wife has not gone so well." Oh, because yeah. she is every bit as easy easily scared as you are, <laughs> and I've tried to shell shock her into you know a trained state like uh, like I did the cat, and she has been training resistant, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> apparently there may be some hardwired thing that's that's there but uh i don't know that's yeah so my, my next quote wow a little background uh, for for life here right uh my next quote um plan the flight and fly the plan but don't fall in love with the plan be open to a changing world and let go of the plan when necessary so that you can make a new plan Then, as the world and the plan both go through their book of changes, you will always be ready to do the next right thing. I I, I really liked that idea again. Is, uh, uh, again, because there's so much, um, so much about this book that that emphasizes that. I, I love the section in there in this book about how where we really get into trouble a lot of times in survival situations and then extending that to other you know situations in general is when our mental models for things, when our internal world, when the map we have inside our head doesn't correspond to the actual territory we're in. And then the test of a survivor is the survivor's humble enough and aware enough to recognize the dissonance there and change the mental model instead of trying to make the territory conform to the mental model, which as we've seen in, you know, prior episodes, uh, we, you know, particularly in the uh, episode, um, mistakes were made, but not by me. Uh, that book talks about how cognitive dissonance people tend to actually try to make the outside conform to their inside rather than vice versa. And, And this really emphasizes that point about, training yourself to be constantly aware and constantly perceptive to what's actually in the world outside so that you can shift your mental model. The map in your head is not the actual territory and being aware of that disconnect is really important. I, 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 I found that to be a very compelling, uh, section of the book. Yeah. And my next one is, is right along those lines. Psychologists who study survival say that people who are rule followers don't do as well as those who are of independent mind and spirit. <laughs> and so I, it, it was funny throughout this book. I just wrote in the columns, I wrote me and then I wrote my wife and <laughs> me. I, I'm the rule follower uh, from your last quote. I'm the person with the plan. I like to stick to that plan. Yep. I like to stick to that plan even when things go haywire. Because it's the plan. I like I like the plan. You like the security and, uh, of the plan. Yeah, and my wife is more of independent minded spirit. And over and over in this book, you you see that the people who survive are the are the non rule followers, the the rule breakers, and those who are of independent mind and spirit, not yeah, the not outside those the who, box people. Yeah, not those who can put it together an elaborate plan and then follow it to a T. That's that's not going to get you to survive in a changing uh, environment. So. Yeah, yeah. And, what, and, and what's funny about this is that, of course, I'm in the opposite situation where I kept, you know, doing the same thing. We're like, yeah, well, that's me. I'm the rule breaker, uh, yeah. not the rule follower here. But I married someone who's much closer to you on that, where who is much more likely to, you know, she... she uh, funny thing about my wife is she, when she was, uh, was, was growing up, went to this uh, uh, private... Uh, private Christian, like K through ninth grade or whatever, and was so conscientious that she, I, I believe she never actually didn't turn in a piece of homework over that entire time that she was there because it would have been a breach of uh, integrity. 
Yeah. And she and and she and she did she read every page of assigned reading through the entire time. And so when I started dating her and she was just finishing, uh, finishing college and I, w- I was finding out that she was like, she would actually read every page assigned in a class and would do, you know, it was like, there was a, there was a con- like a really strong conscience on this, which I regard as a weak conscience that she would just go about that. Like, Oh no, I, I this was assigned. I have to do it. And I'd be like, why can you learn it by, is, you know, can you learn it by not reading that and, you know, going and goodwill, finding the shortcut, shortcut? Goodwill hunting. Yeah. It's like, goodwill find the hunting. shortcut. Do it in five minutes instead of in five hours. Why not? It's like, yeah. but then I'm not, like, I'm not doing what was assigned. Yeah, but who cares? The question is whether you learn. So she's gotten a ton more flexible, but at times she still confesses to the fact that being married to me and my way of a- approaching things at times still is uh a strain on her conscience (laughs) yeah yeah so yeah yeah so uh your uh let's see is it my turn now yep yeah okay um ah the next one and it's again totally related to the last one that i that i uh that i read this is just a sentence fragment that i just loved the picture trying to land the model instead of the plane I, that that just totally depicts that that lack of flexibility that we really that that can that can be deadly like no no this is this is what it's like no but look <laughs> the circumstances the situation has changed and now it calls for a different response don't try to land the model try to land make sure you're landing the plane and not the model love that image yeah well in in the image i i, I think for this particular one is is where they're trying to land the plane on the aircraft carrier, correct? Yeah, yeah. That that's uh that, that was that's one of the uh one of the illustrations for this. But I think this quote comes from toward the middle of the book where he's talking about his father. Uh, but I, I I don't actually remember for sure. I can look that up as you're as you're doing okay. your uh, your well, next quote. But but just the point of it being, it, it's it's not solid ground, right? And there, there's a lot changing the the boats flipping up in the air depending on the waves and all that and and so you can't you can't just go in with your your regular plan of of this is how I'm going to land the plane perfectly it's it's a yeah. lot of things going on while you're this quote you're actually to. this quote actually came during the uh the section on the on Mount Hood but it says uh countless airliner crashes all all happened in part while people were denying the clear warnings before them trying to land the model instead of the plane so yeah. it's it's using that as an illustration, but it, again, it's going back to that whole thing in, 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 at the beginning about the, uh, the the fighter jets having to land basically on something that's like a postage stamp at their speed, uh, you know, landing on, a, on an aircraft carrier and how unnatural that is and how you have to adjust. Yeah. Uh, my next one, survival is a continuous spiritual and physical act that spans a lifetime. And I loved this. He he got into more of the spiritual side of of survival and prayer and and yeah just more more of a spiritual aspect of of people who survive uh it not just gritting their teeth and 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 just going going through it but really uh getting getting on a deeper level and and those people being being survivors so those a cool section of the book and and i liked this quote that that uh highlighted that part of it yeah, one of the things that actually stood out to me about some of that is how he said, even you know, regardless of whether people actually believe in God, the people who pray <laughs> find you know have 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 some uh, you know they they tend to find some uh, some survivor will somehow that that there is some correlation between the people who uh, who wind up you know falling to their knees early on in this in the situation and praying again regardless of whether or not they you know they believe in god or not some people find themselves in that situation and they pray and it's like well i don't know if god's out there but i i you know i fell to my knees and prayed he said that tends to be a common response of survivors whereas a lot of other people tend not to people who who don't respond so well tend not to have that response and and i thought that was interesting one thing uh, on a on a kind of a a tangent here that i found really interesting in the book is he he talks about how long it takes to die from lack of food, lack of water, and then you know, exposure to the cold and, and that sort of thing. And one really interesting thing about people who die 
is they die in less time than it takes to starve or or uh, be without water. So they a large a large percentage, yeah. That people yeah, the people die not from necessarily an organic fa- uh, uh, like a purely organic function, which is fascinating. Yeah, and so it it, it has more to do with panic at that point. It and will. Like. Yeah. I mean, there's will, a certain yeah, amount of will just, that like people just lose the will to live. And so they die. Yeah. They just don't wake up. That's, that's a fascinating thing to me. Yeah. That, that, that startled me in the book. That well, was, I mean, that was pretty interesting. one of, one of the survivors, what would, they were out, uh, in, in, they were out at sea with no water for five days. You're supposed to die at three, right? They lasted yeah. five. They refused to die. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain level of that, which I, I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So is it your, your um, quote? Um, I think I think it's yours. Okay. Um, well, because I did the uh, spiritual one. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. So uh, next one uh, for me. The word "experienced" often refers to someone who's gotten away with doing the wrong thing more frequently than you have. <laughs> <laughs> And again, I, I love that quote because it's absolutely true that experience doesn't necessarily mean better. And it certainly doesn't uh, always mean better equipped uh, that that, you know, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect practice makes permanent. And in a number of these, the cases of people not surviving in the book, they are people who had lots of experience and were led astray by their overconfidence due to their experience. And they, you know, gotten away with stuff in the past that they didn't get away with this last time. Mm-hmm. And, and there, there's so many avenues of life that that particular quote has application to the word experienced often refers to someone who's gotten away with doing the wrong thing more frequently than you have. So humility a humble person who's willing to live or who's willing to learn from, from uh, surroundings and those around him or her. I'll take that person over the experienced person in the long term any day. Yeah. Why don't you hit your first one there? Cause it, I'll, I'll do a, another one. Uh, uh, well, we, we had this, we had the same, we had the same quote here. That's why you're doing that. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one's one we both really, really liked. And this is his daughter's first rule for life, which is be here now. I, I, I love it because again, it's, there's something to, and we've talked about this on prior podcasts. I've always had a thing where I've noticed people and and I've always been attracted to people who have who are like, and I've always ex- explained it this way that like that person is present. Mm-hmm. Like that person, when you're with that person, that person's there. Like when, when that person is doing something, that person is, is, is all in on that thing. And you can see that that person's awake and is in, is awake and alive and present. And so many of us go through large portions of our lives on autopilot where we're really not there. And that be here now is that's something that we should strive for as often as as often as possible. Yeah, and I thought it was really cool because he, the author made these rules of like first rule for life with his daughter. His daughter was six years old at the time, so <laughs> uh, that was cool. But the uh, I I also added another thing at the end of this where the contrast to be here now was what he he said of people who said get there now, and. I, I'm, I'm more that get there now type of of person. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, that, that I loved that. And he kept, he kept going back to that throughout the book of, of be here now, uh, and, and talking about that in, in survival situations. So, and and uh, I would say, I would say one of the things that comes up with that, or one of the distinctions there is that it's a distinction between process oriented thinking and destination or outcome oriented thinking. And it's okay to want to get there. But the thing is, the only way you're going to get there is to actually be here and do the right things here in order to get there. If you mm-hmm. focus too much on the outcomes, then the process, then it's going to get in the way of whatever processes actually need to be done properly in order for, for there to be success. And so, you know, that's the thing. I'm very goal driven. I'm very destination oriented, but I'm also, I've also learned that the only way to successfully reach goals is to focus on process and not outcome. As soon as you focus on outcome, 
and and he talks about this in other language generally throughout the book but as soon as you focus on outcome as soon as you as you're focused on getting there now you either freeze or you panic one or the other you freeze up or you panic and you do something wild and you you have to get your eyes off of the destination off of the outcome and break things down into the little process steps in order to succeed. And, and that, that's a, a really good contrast, I think. Yeah. So my, my last one, a survival situation brings out the true underlying personality. Our survival kit is inside us, but unless it, it, it's there before, but unless it's there before the accident, it is not going to appear magically at the moment it's needed. And this is something I hit on earlier, but it's the daily habits. It's not, if you, if you're, if you're expecting in, in, in the moment of crisis to, to all of a sudden be the hero, it's, it's, it's probably not going to happen that way. And so what, what can you be doing now? What, what can we do, be doing every day? Uh, the, those daily habits. Yeah. And th- this That's, also corresponds nicely to, uh, to a lot of, of what's in, uh, natural born heroes. Mm-hmm. which emphasizes that point as well that you know the cretans and others like them were they you know they became he- heroic not because suddenly in the moment they became heroes but because they their lifestyles had trained them to be so and and again that's something that that comes up over and over again that survivors are survivors because they're survivors mm-hmm. <laughs> because they live as survivors even before the uh before before these uh you know potentially horrible things happen yeah All right, my final one is rigid people are dangerous people. Rigid people are dangerous people. And again, I agree with that because fundamentally speaking, I think you can substitute the word rigid for pride or for proud most of the time and you don't lose much meaning. In fact, because of the way that we tend to define pride as, oh, you know, that person thinks that he's really good at such and such, and, you know, he's, you know, he's proud or she's proud. That's actually not what it is to be proud. <laughs> Maybe that person is really good at what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's fine. The question is, is that person flexible enough to continue to learn and develop even after they become an expert in that area? And if the flexibility remains, if the the teachability remains, then that person's not proud at all. That person's still humble. But the moment you become rigid, that's why pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, as the as the proverb says, because a rigid person breaks under under pressure. A proud person doesn't doesn't bend and flex with you know with the changing circumstances and depends on old expertise that maybe all of a sudden because of because of change or chance is suddenly irrelevant and because well i'm not willing to learn i'm inflexible and i'm i've i've become uh un uh un, 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 uh i become closed to anything from outside now i'm in a place where i'm i'm seriously at risk of destruction yeah that's good well let's uh let's get into our nitty-gritty and uh, I want to start off this section by asking you about your experience on <laughs> Mount Hood because Mount Hood plays a, a pretty big role in this book. And you've climbed that mountain. How many times have you climbed it? So I climbed it, I summited it once and uh, climbed it to the midpoint of the hog's back a second time and turned back. Okay. The first time I actually went, I climbed to the middle part of the hog's back and turned around and, and did not summit. The second time I summited. Uh, and so your, your summit photos are some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Well, actually, the wild thing is that when I climbed it the second time, you know, you start the climb uh, depending on the time of year. But generally speaking, you want to start the climb in the early morning hours. You know, we started at like 4 a.m., I think, uh, because you want to you want to summit while it's still while while the snowpack isn't uh, isn't um, isn't getting loose because you don't want to happen what happened to these people where suddenly you slide and now all of a sudden you're down in the crevasse, um, in the, uh, uh, Bergschrund, if I remember right. Um, but, uh, what I didn't know when we started to climb that, that night or that early morning is that there was going to be a lunar eclipse that night. And so we got 
almost to the summit. And then we looked out to our to our left, which is to the east, as you're climbing up from uh, from Timberline Lodge. And all of a sudden we realized like, oh, my gosh, like the ma- the mountain is casting its shadow on the moon. Like you could see the, the shadow of the mountain, like because as the sun was starting to come up, the last thing between the like the last piece of the earth from our perspective between the earth and the moon was the shadow of the mountain which was cast on the on the moon so i got a couple just unbelievable pictures which is too bad that you know i had a more limited camera at that time than you know than it's amazing how much camera technology has improved in recent years but i got one of the best pictures i'll ever take even though the quality of the picture isn't as good because of what i took it with but it's just wild to see that particular thing some really beautiful imagery and beautiful sight from up there but um but yeah this uh, the 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 sections on mount hood in this book were really familiar <laughs> yeah and uh and it was one of those like oh yeah i know exactly like i could go right there like he wrote it so descriptively and i could go right there in my mind and everything he was saying was like yep yep i remember that yep i remember that you know and uh, and all the way down to, yeah, it's not the toughest thing to summit. It's not, you know, it's not an especially difficult climb, but that doesn't make it not dangerous. Yeah. Which is something that we took very seriously. I went and, and climbed it with, uh, with a good friend of mine, uh, who was living out in, uh, in Portland at the time. Uh, and you know, we took it very seriously. Uh, and we also chose not to rope together, uh, for precisely the reason that, uh, that, that the book gets in, you know, there's, uh, there's a quote in there and I'll, I'll paraphrase it where it says, you know, that the only thing a rope guarantees is that you won't die alone, <laughs> you know, and, and we basically well, and, had and, done our research and discovered that that was, you know, cause we wanted to make sure we met, we, we summited and we climbed properly and we did our research and found, eh, it's actually going to be better off if we don't, rope together if we if we just are very you know if we're very good at if we get good practice at self-arrest and making sure that we are uh you know by the numbers and how we climb we're better off than if we rope together because if you do rope together the the worst thing is going to happen is probably going to happen that if one of you starts sliding then both of you go and then it actually it you know it multiplies the 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 the, the risk it doesn't it doesn't reduce it even though it may feel safer yeah and for those who haven't read the book, the, the particular case that he discusses for Mount Hood were, uh, was, was a situation where four people were roped together and, and uh, they, did they all end up dying? Um, not all of them. No, there, were, uh, there was one that, uh, that survived. That one survived, okay. I think there might have been two, but, but I know there was one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, one of these things is, you know, the first time we climbed it, we actually... We, like I said, we failed to summit and we, we actually learned a lot on that particular climb. And, you know, it's a, it's a humbling thing. It's humiliating because, you know, I, I, I pride myself in keeping in good condition. He, he also did. Uh, and we, you know, we didn't want to fail at what we were doing, but there was a certain point where, you know, I had no sleep. I mean, I, I hadn't slept in 20 hours by the time I started getting, you know, to the hogs back, uh, which is that, uh, very it's it's basically like a a a a, a thousand foot ridge just below the uh below the the summit and i got to that point and i was starting to starting to have trouble and i was realizing uh, actually i'm looking at an old journal that i did afterwards and i I said you know i was thinking at that time wow i'm stumbling like a drunken fool Hmm. and as i as i realized that by the time i got to about ten thousand feet it's like you know i i i made good progress up the hogs back and then decided, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, all I wanted to do is lay down and sleep. I, 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 and I realized after the fact that after I did more research that partly because of my asthma uh, and I hadn't taken an inhaler up there with as cold as it is up there, I'd gotten altitude sickness, uh, which was not helped by the sulfur, uh, that, that you get from the the fumaroles up there because it's an active volcano. And so I decided to turn around. I was not willing to try to summit in that in those conditions, and I took the fail. And it's humbling, but the next time I you know I went back a year later and we summited it easily. Mm-hmm. We 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 understood what we were getting into and we did it properly. So, um, you know that that uh, like I said, there there was a lot there in the in in the hood chapter that that rang true. 
and actually kind of made me feel a little bit better about not not getting up there the first time because that was one of the one of the lessons uh, in the appendix. And this is something that if, if if you're interested in this book and don't really have time to read all of it, the appendix is is worth is worth it on its own. Where it's got you know these are the you know the twelve things that all the that all these survivors tend to do, and one of the uh, one of the lessons. Uh, is uh, what is it? I'm looking at it here. It is uh, commune with the dead. <laughs> oh God, no! <laughs> Give me a second. Know your stuff. Well, yeah. Well, that was actually a, an important one. But no, there was one that that, and it may not have actually been in the in the list of twelve. Now that I think about it, there's one that was basically saying, oh. you know, don't be afraid to to. Uh, yeah, here it is. It's before the twelve. So he he puts these various um. The, here's what survivors do. But before that, he has this, when in doubt, bail out. Yeah. And that, you know, I, I read that and I went, you know, we did that. And, you know, re, I'm looking at like my little, uh, I, I wrote a little piece after I'd done it. Uh, and um, uh, and here's here's a little part that I'd written, you know, back back after after turning back. Uh, I'd said, uh, when watching the climbers descending from the summit, I began to notice more ice breaking off and rolling down the hill. <laughs> At that point, better to return down the mountain than to die or get injured trying to reach the top. My pride said that I needed to make it, but <laughs> I knew that, you know, uh, I knew that uh, turning back was, was the better choice. Disappointed and beaten, I began my descent, recruiting a fellow from the group ahead of me to take a picture of me on the hog's back. The experienced guide of that group smiled, telling me that he felt I made the right choice and it was going to be a tricky climb at that point. I then discovered that my water pack was frozen solid by this point and I couldn't take a drink. Jeez. But, you know, again, it's one of those moments where, you know, thinking back to that, yeah, it was disappointing. And yeah, you know, I, I, I paid money to go out and, and fly out to a friend and all that. But that lesson, when in doubt, bail out, as it says in the book, it's a tough one. You've paid for airfare. You've waited all year for this trip. You've bought all your equipment. It's hard to admit that things aren't going your way. At times like that, it's good to ask yourself if it's worth dying for. And, you know, honestly, that that rang really true, going back to Hood. Uh, and, you know, had I tried to do it, I don't know what would have happened, but it wouldn't have been the right choice. And the the humble choice is the one that <laughs> that, that would be the right choice there and and. Looking back at it, you know, that was the right thing. And like I said, the next year we went up and, and summited with no no difficulty whatsoever. Well, and it's it's the situation a lot of people are in when, uh, throughout this book. You, you know, you mentioned that you're 20, 20 hours being awake and, you know. Uh, altitude sick. Yeah, altitude sickness uh, at the other point where your water had frozen. So it, you're not you're not like in a great situation to start out with when you're when you're having to make these decisions. So it's just all the more important to have those daily daily habits in mind and, and to, to be prepared in, in a different way, because you're not it's not going to be an ideal situation to, to start out with. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, this is one of those things I'm looking back at the little thing that I'd written and, you know, I've got all sorts of, in hindsight, there are several things we could have done different, or uh, we, we should do differently, et cetera. And, you know, went, went down that list. And then the next time we did it, we went and we did everything on that list. And the climb was so easy. Huh. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, that maybe I'll, uh, maybe we should put up one of the, one of the photos or a couple of the photos from that, uh, in the, uh, when we when we post this, I'll uh, I'll see if I can get it, get a couple uh, get a couple up there. In any yeah. case, um, let's get That'd to cool. more discussion of the book itself. Okay, yeah. So um, there there were a, I, I've mentioned this in other podcasts that you know there, there's things that you read in these types of books where it's like okay yeah I, that's that's pretty obvious I would I would guess that but then there's also things that that you read and 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 they're just out of the ordinary and. It, they really stick out. One of those things for me was hearing that um, children under six years old have the best chance of survival. Yeah, that's fascinating. And again, why? Yeah. Because they're humble. That's my yeah. answer. Yeah. They're humble and they listen to their bodies and they don't try to do stupid stuff. Yeah. 
But that's the that's who everyone in those kind of situations. That's who everyone tries to protect. Right. Whereas oh, the, they're, they're they're little kids. We got to protect them. But they have the best chance of survival. And the worst chance of survival. Kids between the age of seven and 13. Yeah. Those are the ones that, as he said, are old enough to be able to to um, to take adult risks, but generally not with any adult wisdom. So they end up getting themselves in real trouble. Yeah, they'll they'll plod on and they'll they'll try to push further and they'll you know even when they're tired they'll keep going and they'll do all this and they'll wind up you know getting further and further lost and all that whereas you know the six year old just gets lost and goes I'm lost and sits down yeah <laughs> the the you know eight year old just you know keeps marching on can convinced that you know that it can be fixed and yeah. I do think that there's something that happens it does seem like somewhere around seven years old. For most people, and for some people it's earlier, but, you know, on, on the aggregate, it's around seven years old where it seems like um, people start, that's where, like, the pride monster starts to jump in. Like, we're all, so, like, you've got two kids. You know full well that a six-month-old has learned to be manipulative and selfish. We're all manipulative and selfish pretty early. Mm -hmm. But that whole notion of, uh, like pride and protecting one's ego and potentially being unwilling to learn like that really, I th I think it, in on the aggregate starts to kick in around that seven year old mark. Like as you get to prepubescence, just at that, you know, beginning of adolescence, you start to see the development of the ego and all of a sudden the real danger becomes that unteachableness, that, that pride, that rigidity that ultimately if it's not dealt with at that early age, starts to uh starts to cause problems it can eventually cause a lot of problems later in life mm -hmm. well one other thing that really stuck out in the book is the paradox of survival and i, I remember reading about this in in um in stories of, of holocaust survivors that uh in in this paradox of survival is that when you are, are doing something for someone else. Uh, so like in the particular situation with the Holocaust survivors, uh, they, they would, they would go out of their way to give food to people who needed it perhaps more than they did, but you're already starting at where you're, you're getting very little food. So most people are trying to hoard as much as they can. Uh, I remember the story in the book unbroken of, of, um, when once the plane crashed, there were three men in a in a raft, and and they were there for ended up being for many days. Um, one of the guys in the raft, they so Louis Zamperini is the the main character, uh, a, a real life character in 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 the story. But he right from the beginning says, okay, we need here's what we have food wise, and we need to ration it. And they had a few chocolate bars, and in the and he he rationed it to where they were just pretty much get a sliver each day. And he woke up one morning, uh, one of the first, first days of the, uh, of surviving in the, in the ocean. And one of the guys had eaten the whole chocolate. Oh bar. yeah. Yeah. I'd heard. I remember that now. And that was the first guy to die. And so he would have been the first guy to die if I'd been on that raft. Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, it, and it wasn't from getting beat by the other, <laughs> no, other guys. He, he'd have gotten but, thrown to the sharks. But there's this, like, there's this paradox of, the people in in survival situations, the people who try to hoard, the people who try to to make sure that they're going to make it, uh, are the ones that either die or they they don't they don't do as well as those who are are thinking of others, and that could even be uh, he he the author talks about thinking of someone at home, make making sure that you survive this so that you can go back to your family, um, so just having someone to think about or, or someone to take care of in these situations that can actually lead to survival. Uh, and, and this was in the section around, of uh, the faith, having faith in, in survival situations and, and praying. So just kind of some neat things there with, uh, that, that might not be expected, uh, where you, you may want to try to make sure that you're going to be okay by, by hoarding everything you can, um, and eating, eating as much as you can, that type of thing. But just a weird thing of, of actually, if you, if you give your food to, to others and, and you have some, someone else in your mind, you, you may actually survive. Yeah. Survivors tend to be the gener more generous ones, which is fascinating. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, um, you know, and, and again, I, I think a lot of this comes back to learning to get out of your own head, out of the introspection and, and you know, again, like you said, the necessity of doing it for someone else, of keeping someone else in mind. When you're actually worried about someone else, suddenly that takes the pressure off. That takes the, there, there's, a, there's a paradoxical thing that happens with us where our survival, when, when our survival is threatened or when our ego is threatened, then it's easy to panic or freeze up. But as soon as we get our attention off ourselves, that's when we're, that's when we're free to do, you know, whatever needs to be done. So, it, it, you know, I, I, I do a lot of public speaking and as you know, when, when you, when you do public speaking, that that's one of the primary fears for lots of people. Well, why? Well, it's because people are afraid they're going to make a fool of themselves in front of a bunch of people. And so what happens is people will get up there and they'll start thinking about themselves. And then that's paralyzing. It's like, oh no, what, what are, what are people going to think? What, they're looking at me and, and all of a sudden, because your, in, your eye turns in on itself, turns in on you, all of a sudden it, you're paralyzed. But mm-hmm. the, the trick to this is recognizing that I'm not up here to talk, like I'm not up here about, like this isn't about me. I'm up here to talk about something. My focus is on the thing that I'm, that I'm, that I'm speaking about. My focus is on the few people in the audience that hopefully will get something out of what I have to say. Right. So all of a sudden, as soon as my focus turns outward, I'm liberated to actually do whatever needs to be done without any real stress. And that, I think, is where the, the, the generosity comes in, in in these situations where the people who survive are the ones that were helping the other people. Oftentimes, even when they were the worst injured, that person's trying to help the other person. And it's the person that that was trying to help that actually survives. So I, and I think there is something to that in terms of the mindset. And that's something that, that can and should be practiced on a daily basis. And, and mm-hmm. also, this is a big part of, of the people that, that manage to overcome depression, right? One, the, one of the best cures for depression, uh, and again, uh, I'm, you know, I'm the wrong kind of doctor, uh, so... You know, this is not medical uh, ad- advice here. I'm not. I'm not saying don't. You know, don't uh, don't take your don't take medicine, prescribe medicine or whatever. But one of the most important things for dealing with with uh, uh, with depression is finding purpose, and usually that that involves finding a way to serve other people and to connect and get in get into a serving relationship with, in a in a community environment. Because what happens so easily with, with depression is we start introspecting, we focus on ourselves, and then we continue to just black hole. And it gets, just gets darker and darker and darker the more inward we go. And we ha- in order to escape that, we have to get outside. We have to do what seems to be totally counterintuitive. Well, I'm depressed. I don't have anything to give right now. That's precisely why you need to give right at this moment. <laughs> right? That's And that's the thing that Again, uh, I, and this also connected to the other thing that, we, that came up uh, in talking about a couple of the deep sea things. People who are on, on these rafts for, you know, days and weeks, finding, like, jobs to give themselves. Finding ways to, like, to pass the time with purpose. Like, oh, you know what? I'm going to try to make this little device that's going to make this just a little bit easier. And they spend, like, two or three days on it. And it keeps them sane. Keeps them mm-hmm. lucid and it keeps them alive. Finding purpose and purpose outside ourselves is imperative to living a good human life and to being more than just a survivor, but a thriver. And and again, this book touches on that in a few different ways. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to highlight in, uh, in our nitty gritty section here? I got a question for you. I, I, maybe you can answer this. Why um, there was a there was an example of a of a young lady who uh, was flying uh, with a friend, and then her friend's uh, fiance, or as I like to pronounce it, finance, uh, <laughs> to a uh, to a picnic. They're flying uh, to you know some other location, and they ended up crashing into a, a mountaintop. And uh, it, it mentions that, you know, she made her way down the mountain wearing uh, high-heeled boots 
in a short skirt with no underwear. And I, I wondered if maybe you had an idea on why she wasn't wearing underwear to this picnic. Maybe it flew off. Maybe I, it flew off. I, I, I just found th- there are little details like this at different points in the book that left me going, okay, now, now I want to know like why, <laughs> but there, there, there are certain places where we don't, it's just enough, uh, enough uh, information to leave us wondering why. Well, the author's still alive, so you, you <laughs> hit him up on Twitter. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a, a good question for all of our listeners. All of our listeners should 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 hit him with that particular question. Let's uh, let's tweet tweet storm him with uh, you know however many, and it's not that many yet. But over over the over the whenever you listen to this episode, ask him that question. <laughs> that way he can he can know that at least some people are still paying attention to his book, um, yeah. which is always nice for an author. A um, couple other things that I found interesting. Uh, one was the the concept of risk homeostasis. I, I, you, you remember that part? No. That that's the the idea that um, that people find in uh, generally find a level of risk that they're comfortable with, and then they just basically modulate their lives so that they stay in that risk territory. So if it if something feels you know, if the risk level drops below that usual level of homeostasis, then they'll start taking more risks. And then if they feel less comfortable, then they'll reduce their risk taking. But they, this concept I found interesting that, and and so some people have a higher risk tolerance. And so they, they try to live more in that higher risk area than other people might. Uh, But the thing that I found fascinating is that that means that this concept of risk homeostasis means to a large degree that we can't, uh, engineer our way out of danger right and it, it uses the illustration of anti-lock brakes as uh as evidence for this saying you know when you know they invented anti-lock brakes they initially thought that that would reduce the number of accidents and fatalities but as it turned out it didn't it people just drove more drove worse yeah you know this is that phenomenon that when you have a safer car you tend to drive more dangerously yeah, because you feel again the risk tolerance is where it is, and so now you feel more comfortable driving more dangerously, and that mm-hmm. I find fascinating. That again, technology isn't always gonna isn't always a way to to find a way around risk tol- or, or around uh, risk taking. I think football, American football, is a great example of that. You know, there's all this concern about head injuries and concussion and all this, and you know, guys have known that you you know you hit certain ways and you're going to get concussions and all this for years. And what people did is they made better and better, they've made better and better helmet technology over, you know, the, the last couple generations of, of American football. And the response to that has been that players began using their helmet in their head as a weapon when tackling. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oh yeah. You know, back in the days of leather helmets and no face mask, you didn't generally just <laughs> dive in there with your head and use your head and your face as a weapon. Now with a, with a, totally protective face mask and good helmet technology. Now I can use this as a, as the tip of the missile. <laughs> and again, it's a good example of risk homeostasis. I, I found that, that little section of the book, uh, interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, I loved uh, his, his explanation where he said, you know, it'll be interesting. This was after, uh, after the space shuttle, uh, uh, challenger, uh, had, um, uh, had crashed and he was saying it would be interesting or he was quoting someone as saying it will be interesting to see if NASA tries to take on this challenge explaining to the public that doing bold things isn't about engineering risk to zero <clears throat> stuff happens and if we want to restrict ourselves to things where <clears throat> stuff can't happen we're not going to do anything very interesting and so this idea that risk is inevitable and we have to decide where our risk tolerance is in order to do anything. And that, I, I think that's an important, an important little lesson. Mm-hmm. Any other, any other stuff for you? No, I, I was just going to hit one other thing uh, in, in our conclusion. Okay. Well, I've got one more thing I can do in the conclusion as well. So let's go ahead and, and wrap it up. Okay. I, I thought this was a really important book and one that's applicable across the board because it's not just about life and death situations. It's about, it's about everyday living. Uh, it comes down to character and character doesn't come through reading books. It comes from the daily habits 
the daily choices and the daily struggles, the daily struggles that we have. Uh, this book reminded me of a, of a story I heard of David Goggins, the, the Navy SEAL who, um, went, went through three hell weeks. He has the record for most pull-ups in a day. Uh, he, he's a stud. They, they say he's the, the strongest, strongest man alive. Uh, a lot of people will say that. And he was out running one day and this car pulled up next to him and the guy rolled down the window and, and asked him for directions. And, and then, uh, the driver said, by the way, what, what are you training for? And David Goggins responded. He said, I'm training for life. And I thought that was great. This is a guy who does, he'll do a hundred mile races. And, and so he, he may have been training for a, a particular race, but he said he was training for life. So anytime that he was out doing runs, it was, it was it was training for life. And I, I, I love, I love that story. I love that he said that, but this, this book talked a lot about that. The, the daily habits and the daily choices that we make that we're, we're training for something else. We're training for these survival situations that may come up and, and probably will come up at some point. So his, his main point in, in all this is that survival is a well-lived life. And it's not the one time you survived an accident. It's, it's your whole life. And, and I loved that he even talked about that at, at death that in, as, as he quoted, the, you, you can't know how someone has survived their entire life until you've seen how they've died and if, if they've died well. So yeah, just across the board, a, a, a really good book, a, a very helpful book. And, um, and one that that'll challenge your thinking on on what it means to be a survivor. Yeah, it actually reminds me of uh, of a statement Jim Elliott made about why he began to wrestle when he was at uh, Wheaton College. This is the uh, the missionary who was uh, uh, murdered in in Ecuador uh, in the in the nineteen fifties. But he he said that uh, it, that it was important to always present God as a sharper instrument or a, a sharper tool, something like that. I'll, maybe we can get the uh, the exact quote in the uh, in the um, uh, in the show notes. But you know that was his idea of you know everything you do, you're you're training to be able to serve someone else better. You know that so yeah, you should you know make sure that that what wherever you are and and you know he's got his other um, his other quote wherever you are, be all there. You know, so this uh, this this whole thing, again, connects to some of those ideas that let's just make sure that uh, that whatever whenever some circumstance comes up where we're prepared, where 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 we're needed, we're prepared, we're prepared to to do what's necessary. Actually, that also reminds me that uh, I and some of the guys that I've trained over the years, uh, we have a, an exercise that um, that uh, involves pushing a car around uh and, uh, and, you know, I, I took to calling that exercise, uh, doing good Samaritans. <laughs> so like good Samaritans today, guys, why? Because, well, you know, the time, may, the time is going to come at some point where you're going to see someone who ran out of gas or car broke down or whatever, and you're going to need to get behind the car and help them push. Well, let's go ahead and train for that guys. <laughs> well, so we're the, doing our good idea. Samaritan drills. It's the idea that we, we, we saw in, in natural born heroes too, where the, it was be, be fit to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. The idea, like the one guy was talking about, okay, I've got two kids and a wife. If my house is burning down and I need to carry them out of my house, I need to be able to do that. So what does that mean in, in my training that I'm able to have all of them on my shoulder while running? And that's that's how he trained for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Last thing I want to, last thing I want to talk about in the uh, conclusion gets back to this, uh, this sense of humor under pressure. So in addition to humility, the other thing that really stuck out to me in this book and that, that is a strong takeaway has to do with how to deal with fear and how to deal with the emotional reactions and responses that were, that we would typically have in the face of a highly stressful or strain, situ straining situation so whether this is, you know, playing a, a sport under great pressure, you know, you have to hit the final shot, you're at the foul line with no time left or whatever. How do you handle this? Well, he talks about how the the highest performers tend to do this with just sometimes with droll humor or sometimes grotesque humor. 
and finding ways to turn, as he puts it, turn fear and anger into focus. And you do this by drawing your attention away from the fear and the anger, oftentimes by acknowledging the circumstance, the situation, and being able to laugh at it. And yeah. that laughter, as he puts it, the grotesque humor of the fighter pilots then, that secret language contains truths we don't even know we know. Moods are contagious, and the emotional states involved with smiling, humor, and laughter are among the most contagious of all. Laughter doesn't take conscious thought. It's automatic, and one person laughing or smiling in induces the same reaction in others. Laughter stimulates the, the left prefrontal cortex, an area in the brain that helps us feel good and be motivated. That stimulation alleviates anxiety and frustration. There's evidence that laughter can send chemical signals to actively inhibit the firing of nerves in the amygdala, thereby dampening fear. Laughter, then, can help to temper negative emotions. And while all this may seem a purely academic interest, it could prove helpful when your partner breaks his leg at 19,000 feet in a blizzard on a Peruvian mountain. It's not a lack of fear that separates elite performers from the rest of us. They're afraid, too. But they're not overwhelmed by it. They manage fear. They use it to focus on taking correct action. Mike Tyson's trainer, Customato, said, Fear is like fire. It can cook for you. It can heat your house. Or it can burn you down. And Tyson himself said that fear was like a snap, like a little snap of light I get when I fight. I love that feeling. It makes me feel secure and confident. It suddenly makes everything explosive. It's like, here it comes again. Here's my buddy today. It's a dangerous place to be, too. Control can easily slip away, as Tyson's unusual behavior will attest. <laughs> and one other really good example of this is the famous story of uh, Joe Montana in, he, in leading. A, uh, you know, he gets the, they get the ball with uh, with less than two minutes left in the Super Bowl, and they've got to score a touchdown uh, over. You know, eight, they're eighty yards away. They got to score a touchdown in this two minute drive in the Super Bowl, and he gets in the huddle, and what does he say? He looks at all his guys and then he points and he goes, hey, is that John Candy? And, and like points over at like one of the uh, at one of the people in the in the in the crowd. Like he, he's like, I, I think that's John Candy. And everybody in the, in, the, in the huddle's like, what? Like <laughs> Joe is so cool that like this isn't getting to him. And they went down and scored. And there's some strategy to that. And applying that lesson to our lives when we feel like there's pressure, you know, when there's something going on, find a way to take a, take a step back and find something to poke fun at and, and laugh about it. Even poking fun at the, at the severity of the situation, as I like to tell some of my wide receivers at times, you know, hey, no pressure or anything, just don't blow it because it's all on you. <laughs> and, you know, they'll look at me kind of funny and then just start laughing. And then it's and, and the, the job has been done now that the situation's been defused and they can go do their job. Yeah. And, you know, that that I thought was a, a really valuable lesson right up front in this book. One that's worth, I think, wrapping on. Yeah. Well, good stuff. All right. That's going to do it for us today. We're on the interwebs. We're on books of Titans dot com, Twitter and Instagram at books of Titans. And we are on Apple Podcasts, so we'd love to, to see a review from you. I uh, would love to, to uh, hear your thoughts. Next week, we are doing The Art of Learning by Josh Wait, Whiteskin. 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 Yeah, Whiteskin. Whiteskin. Uh, so that, that'll be a fun one. On behalf of Jason Staples, I'm Eric Rostad, and this has been the Books of Titans podcast. Thanks for listening. I guess I'm just going to fade into Bolivian now. Pet choice. <laughs> keep reading, keep listening, and keep improving. Keep it real. Thank you.